I'm going to start and read this passage. It's out of Ecclesiastes 4, 7 through 12. And this is the NIV version, New International Version. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother, no end to his toil. Yet his eyes were not content with the we his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless. Um, a miserable business. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them. Also, if two lie together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So today I'm going to be talking about pursuing companionship, not just connection. Um, a study just came out just a couple weeks ago about uh, I've got a little bit of feedback here about uh, Cigna, and it was about loneliness. And it said that loneliness is common in millennials. And on the study, it said that people were scoring at a 44 on a scale of 20 to 80 as far as loneliness. Um, but those that were 39 to 72 or older were less lonely than millennials currently are. So I wanted to talk about friendship today in terms of this passage. Um, I have a ton of friends. I love meeting new people. I love making connections. But more importantly, I value my friendships, my deep friendships that I have with people. And I have been blessed to have a lot of people in my life over the year that I, years that I have kept in touch with and kept in my friend circle. And so I want to share about a few of them with all of you. Um, first, this is my friend Joy from home and from Rock Island, Illinois. Look at those eyebrows. Um, so this is my friend Joy. Uh, we've been friends. We are actually four generations. Our families have been friends. So I literally remember when her mom was pregnant with her. Um, and as you can imagine, Joy and I fight like we're related, and we used to get into shouting matches sometimes at youth group at church. Um, but so we'd get in these fights and whatever, but we love each other, and we still keep in touch to this day. We talk every couple months. Um, we check in on each other. Next is my friend Adam. Adam and I have been friends since the sixth grade, and we used to get in trouble from our parents because his mom thought he was going to be a wife beater because we would wrestle each other and we would basically beat each other up and so I'd go home with bruises um, so our parents would get mad at us. <clears throat> he and I are still friends to this day. He lives in Chicago with his beautiful wife and their children. And it gives me great pleasure that he has three little boys that are just as rowdy as he was as a kid. That is God having a sense of humor. <clears throat> then there's my friend Chancy. Chancy and I have been friends since college. She was one of my first college friends. And her and I uh, were super tight, and she moved off campus. And so when I needed a place to get away to stay, I would go stay with her at her apartment. In exchange, I would clean her apartment for her. And <clears throat> excuse me, as we've gotten older, we kind of have mutual open door for each other. If one comes to the other's town, we stay with each other. Um, her and her family live in Chicago. Uh, I love Chansey. Next, there's a story behind this. <laughs> <laughs> this is my friend Paul. We met in 2001, and he picked my nose, and I picked his nose back. <laughs> and he said nobody had ever done that, and he freaked out. <laughs> but we've been friends ever since. <clears throat> People call us the twins. Um, they say we're like brother and sister, but he and I have had a lot of similar parallel life experience. And over the years, we've really been a shoulder for the other one to lean on, and he lives in San Diego. Um, this is my friend Tony. Some of you might recognize him. He used to play football in Kansas City. <clears throat> but I met him in 2002 when I was going to Nazarene Seminary in Kansas City. And he took me under his wing. And he was like a big brother. And he encouraged me um, to listen more to the world around me. I know some of you that know me find this probably hard to believe, but I like to talk. Um, <laughs> Tony always reminded me to listen to others and to be still, he would always tell me. And more embarrassing than that, um, when we'd be in social settings, if he didn't think I was acting very pastoral um, or he didn't like the guys I was talking to, he would literally pick me up and put me over his shoulder. He is 6'5", um, and carry me out of that social setting, and I wanted to die. <laughs> um, but he is fantastic, and he helped me learn so much. And I almost quit seminary. I went through this bad breakup, 
And Tony convinced me to stay the course and finish my master's uh, degree. So I have that to thank Tony for. And he and his wife um, live in Newport, and he's a commentator for CBS now. But so love him. Uh, last is some of my San Diego crew. This is Lindsay and Stephanie. They just represent a little portion of my San Diego girls crew. I have this tight circle of girlfriends from San Diego that I've gotten over the years. I moved there in 2005. Um, they're awesome. And just as beautiful as they are, they are just as equally kind. Um, they're funny. They're silly. They're wacky like me. And when we get together, we just have a lot of fun. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed, but everybody in that group that I just talked about, all those people live in different towns. And so I don't see them all the time. But I moved here in 2013, and I really struggled to have those kind of friendships. And I found myself kind of at a loss, which is what I want to get into. But um, I want to get into the passage. Actually, let me go back to this. Um, and this, this passage is out of Ecclesiastes, and it is written by King Solomon. And so King Solomon, a little bit backstory about King Solomon. He was the son of David. Um, he was from Israel. And the Hebrew credits him as building the first temple in Jerusalem. And during his reign, he had vast wealth, he had riches, and it says that he was the wisest king that Israel had ever had. And he, in with that, had many wives. He took many wives. And during his 40-year reign, they said that Israel and the kingdom of Israel was the wealthiest and most successful it had ever been. He had 700 wives. <laughs> <laughs> and 300 concubines. <laughs> it's a lot to keep up with. <laughs> but some of those were political, um, and so he'd taken in other kingdoms, and he even had married one of Pharaoh's daughters, um, so he had that alliance and peace with Egypt. Um, and it says that he was more politically, what I read, politically connected to Pharaoh's daughter versus the other 699 that he really had more of a love with. I don't know how that's possible, but that's what everything I read said. Um, but something that also the Bible talks about is how it wasn't a good thing. You know, the Israelites were followers of God. Well, Solomon let all his wives and concubines bring in their foreign gods and their foreign idols. So there was a whole lot of different religions going on in his kingdom. But his reputation had gotten out and spread so far and wide that in 1 Kings 10.10, 10, it says that the Queen of Sheba even came to see what he was doing and see what he was all about and see his riches. So she came to see his success. Starting in verse uh, 7, uh, this one is a little bit different. I apologize in the version I'm reading out of. But it, mine says, again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. We talked about this last week. Um, in other translations, it says, or then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. Vanity, or habel, is the word in Hebrew, and we talked about that last week. Pastor Jeremy mentioned that that is breath or wind or ashes, it even says, and it's talking about life, about how life is just so fleeting, and it's just like the air. It's just gone. Um, so that's verse 7. Verse 8, it says, there was, no man, uh, there was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. Um, there was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. King Solomon, despite all of his wealth, everything that I read and that I studied this past week, he was depressed. He was depressed and he was feeling alone. He was isolated. So he had all these wives, all these concubines, all these riches. He had connections but he didn't have companionship. And so he's feeling as if all his human efforts are just for nothing. They're for in vain. So in the middle of all that, he's sitting here kind of pondering his life. It shows the despair of where he's really at and that loneliness that he's feeling in his heart. Um, so this isn't just a modern technology or millennial issue. Loneliness has been around since the beginning of human time. I want to talk about that connections but not companionship. And I want to scroll ahead here. I want to pull up a picture that I want to show you guys. So this is my friend Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay and I, she was in that last picture with my friend Stephanie. Um, her and I became quick friends. We actually had lived two blocks from each other in San Diego, but we hadn't known each other until I moved out here and we connected. And then we realized we literally had hundreds of friends in common. 
Um, but we connected at a much deeper level, and she shared openly about her life. And at the time, her younger brother and her mom were living out here, and so she connected me with um, them. And so we just kind of went to a deeper level in our friendship. But Lindsay, you look at Lindsay, she's beautiful. She was the epitome of what it looked to be successful. She taught me how to do my social media, kind of like I do if any of you are on my social media and what I do. It's, I have Lindsay to thank for that. She said, social media is like you're marketing to the world. And she taught me, you know, yes, it's the best of yourself, but it can also really improve your brand. And in my case, she taught me how to share so it would get people kind of hooked into the story of the charity and what we're trying to do at Caridad. Um, but Lindsay was great at that. She was a great social media person. She was a, a, got voted like one of the best travel bloggers. Um, so she was all over the place. And in her circle, um, people that considered her a friend were the likes of Richard Branson, um, Tony Shea, and even the WordPress founder, Matt Mellenwig. So she traveled all, the, all over the world and shared of her adventures online. Lindsay dealt with her own personal demons though. Lindsay struggled with her mental health issues and towards the end she wasn't taking care of herself and she was isolating. In fact, one of her last videos for her Live More Happy blog, which is kind of ironic, that was her website title, um, was her talking about how she just felt so alone in that moment and she was so scared. Um, sorry, I get emotional. On January 1st, my friend Lindsay decided to take her life. She could no longer handle the loneliness and the suffering. She had come to a place where she felt she only had companions and not connection. Those of us that were close with her, that were her true friends, she had pushed us away and she had come to a lonely point in her life and just couldn't take it anymore. I'm going to come back to her because I don't want to bring down the vibe too much. We'll come back to her. But I want to look back at verse 9. I'm going to go back to verse 9. I'm going to read it to you guys. In verse 9, Ecclesiastes 4.9, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Um, the reward that King Solomon is speaking of or sharing about is that true companionship or friendship that I talked about. Um, and he's basically saying, you know, two are better than one um, when you're like-minded. Verse 10, it says, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Um, it says no one in the English version of this, but in the Hebrew translation that no one is translated as a partner. And I think it's important to focus on that partner word because partner isn't like a couple, like you're thinking of, like uh, if, if you're married or anything like that. It quite literally means a partner or a true friend in life. And it's so important that in Matthew 18, 19 and Mark 6, 7, Jesus sends his followers out to minister two by two. And the two there in the Greek means agreement. So they're kind of helping and supporting each other. So it's important to be in twos. Ecclesiastes 4.11, also, if two lie down, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Um, if you've ever snuggled with someone when you're cold, you know that it is warmer when you have two of you. Um, back in the time of King Solomon, their cloaks could be used as a blanket when they lay down at night. And if you've ever been cold on a winter night, you also know that two blankets are way better than one. Um, Ecclesiastes 4.12, though one may be overpowered, Two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. This is talking about the strength that comes, like Jesus' disciples, in the going out in two. Having that two or even better, a three-person bond is better to go out into the world. And Scripture is talking about that companionship versus just connections that will make us stronger. True, true friendships. That no sleep thing is working on my throat. <laughs> um, back to my friend Lindsay. Lindsay had hundreds of friends. She hid her depression. She didn't deal with her own mental health. And towards the end, I watched as she blew me off. And she would go and do things with her connections. It was more and more and more. And she was filling up her time with connections. And ultimately, in the end, she felt lost because she didn't feel like she had those companions. Going through Lindsay's death was a horrible time in 2017. It was hard for me. I was struggling with the charity. Um, I was struggling with some things in my marriage, and my husband was on the road all the time, and I felt really, really, really alone. Um, my hair <laughs> started thinning. My doctor said I lost 50% of my hair, and that was all due to stress. Um, so I was a worrying mess. I started seeing a therapist 
to talk about my issues and to try to just unload that stress on somebody else and everything that I was internalizing. And I told her I was frustrated and I didn't feel like I had any friends and I didn't feel like I had anybody there for me. I had to go back and forth to San Diego as I was trying to navigate things and help plan her funeral and memorial with her family. And I couldn't even get a ride to the airport. And my husband was always gone. And I'm like, I can't get anybody to get my mail. I couldn't get a ride to the airport. And I, I was angry. And I told the therapist this. And she told me that I was lacking friendships. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> she told me that I needed to work on that. <laughs> Equally, duh. <laughs> uh, but it, I realized I was really starving for friendships. And so I started praying about that. And it was the end of 2017, and I started sharing about my struggle publicly. I started sharing my feelings of loneliness with people in my conversations and in my posts on my social media. I shared openly that I was seeing a therapist um, to try to get over some of that. And I shared about Lindsay's struggle, and I shared about mental health awareness and loneliness. Um, and I was surprised. I was surprised that in my transparency, I got stopped when I went out and I talked to people. And all different social settings, people were coming up to me and thanking me for my honesty and transparency. They were writing me privately on my social media accounts or texting me like, thank you for being honest. And a, an overarching theme that I began to hear was people saying, I feel lonely too. I have all these people and all these connections. Some of these people I thought were way connected and part of this posse or that posse. And they're saying, but I don't have friendships. And I started seeing a theme. It was women, and it was successful women. And I thought, I can do something. And I got the bright idea. I have this great house for entertaining. My husband is never home because he's always on the road. I like to cook. Why don't I have a girls' dinner? So I invited some people, and I didn't pick a certain age range. It's 20 to 60. But what I did do was I was intentional about who I invited. And I made sure that the girls didn't know each other. And so I invited girls that didn't know each other to come to dinner. And I even reached out to people that had been in my phone book since I moved here that I thought were really cool people and just respected them. And I hit them up too and said, hey, come over to dinner. I'll cook for you. And what I did was I intentionally didn't have my dinner prepared by the time they got there. So we had to gather in my kitchen and shoulder to shoulder we'd prep the food or the girls would hang out and tell stories, and I watched as natural connections formed. And then after we were done, at each meal, what I do now is I take a picture of the group, and I send out a group text, you know, thank you for coming, here's a photo, and then the girls connect on the group text. And it's been so cool to see the girls connecting or sending positive thoughts to each other, or I love when I go out, and I will be out, and I'll see some of the girls that I know didn't know each other before my girls' dinners, that will be just naturally hanging out with each other without me. That's the best part. Um, it's been so good to have that. And I've gone through struggles these past five months in this year, but it's been great because this group of girls, my girl tribe, um, we've supported each other. And I can't tell you how many times, just the right time I'll get a text from one of the girls checking on me or seeing if I need anything or how they've really stepped up when I needed help with my charity and helped me out. It's just been so awesome to have that support and the companionship, not just the connection. I think the most important thing that my girls' night has taught me is that the companionship or those deeper friendships are important. You know, I thought I knew what friendships look like before, but this is on a whole another level. But it's also helped model healthy friendships for me with this group of girls. Um, these girls are awesome, and some of them are in the room right now, so thank you for being here. And it's, you know, it's from my neighbors, to my downtown faith family, to my sex workers, to my LGBTQ community members that are a part of this, and I just love that, and I love them for being there for me, and we're there for each other. Those healthy relationships have shown me where I needed to work on unhealthy friendships, or as I like to call them, time vampires. <laughs> Do you guys have time vampires in your life? They suck you dry, and they always need you, and they always have a crisis, <laughs> and they're always having a meltdown, and they need you to answer the phone right now, and they're going to call you 15 times or blow up your phone and text you 15 times because it's that important, but it's like a broken record. I call it Groundhog's Day. It's the same thing over and over, and their life never changes. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you guys know somebody like that. I know a lot. 
for me, I realized I had a lot of time vampires in my life. And even though they're cool and whatever, most people are better off in the connection zone, you know, and let, they don't need to be in, in the close inner circle of the friendship zone. And so by having those healthy friendships, I realized I need to say no to my time vampires um, because they're just going to, they're going to suck me dry. <laughs> so it's been good, good to see that and have that. And also on the flip side, the importance of friendship is saying no to those people. You know, it's okay to have healthy boundaries and say no. It's okay not to answer the call. When they call you in the middle of the day, even my mom, I can't, now I can't share this on my Facebook, but even my mom is a time vampire. She will call me acting like it's a crisis at 10 a.m. on a Monday when I'm with my staff and I'll answer the phone. And she'll say, we found old VHSs of your fifth grade um, performance and we want to know, do you want those or not? What are you doing right now? <laughs> Didn't need to answer. And when I say, hey, mom, I'm busy right now. Oh, well, it's just your mother. You don't have time for me. <laughs> time vampire. Time vampire mentality. <laughs> it's okay to put them in time out or let them go to a voicemail and get back to them when you have the time and the energy to deal with it. You know, don't, 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 jump, don't jump when they call all the time. Um, King Solomon. King Solomon had all these connections. You cannot tell me the King Solomon had an honest, deep connection with 700 wives. There is no way. My husband always says he can't handle one of me. I'm crazy enough. There is no way that King Solomon could handle all 700 of those wives. He had all the servants. He had all the money. He had all the fame. He had everything this world could provide. And he was lonely. He was lonely because he had connections and not companions. Where are you at today in your life? Do you have those connections and not companions? Are you, like me, maybe what's blocking off the world from truly connecting with you on that companionship or friendship level? What is it today that's holding you back from those? You need those to live. It's what's healthy. It's what's going to keep you through the rough times. Think about that today.